Welkom, mijn naam is Martin Visser, financieel journalist. U gaat zo kijken naar een lezing van Hendrik Enderlein, een vooraanstaand Duitse econoom, over het vervolmaken van de euro, de eurozone, wat moeten doen na de crisis, wat zijn de lessen van de eurocrisis en hoe zorgen we dat het schip van de euro drijvend blijft. En dat in de tijd dat er veel sceptisch is, veel kritiek op de euro. Het is volledig Engelstalig, het is een glashelder verhaal van Ender Line en ik ga in het debat met hem en het publiek veel plezier met kijken. Tonight I, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, professor Hendrik uh, Enderlein, uh, who is uh, professor of political economy at the Hertie School of Governance uh, in Berlin and is also the director of the Jacques Delors Notre Europe uh, Institute uh, in Berlin who is going to talk about uh, completing the euro. And let me start with a very stark remark. I think in the current institutional setup of the euro, that single currency is not going to survive in the long run. The euro, as I will argue throughout tonight, is probably not sufficiently solid or prepared to survive another big crisis of the kind we have seen. Uh, when you are with your ship on the sea and there is a massive storm and you repair your ship in the storm in order to prevent it from sinking and the storm has gone away, the first thing you do is you go back to harbor, you check the ship and you refurbish it fundamentally if necessary. This is not what we do in the European Union. We actually stay on the sea and say, you know, those quick fixes are very nice. Um, they will help us also in the next storm. And I think that's not the, um, the right way to look at this. Europe's economies are still extremely vulnerable. Real GDP, so the, the, the level of wealth in the economy in many countries and in the euro area average is still below 2008 levels. So we're heading towards a lost decade in terms of growth. And you know all this has triggered crisis fatigue, reform fatigue, and a lot of political fatigue in many countries. I will come back to the rise of populism later in this, in, in this talk. And at the same time, there is this need to reform, to invest, and we have three interacting dangers today. The first one is we have too high debt levels and too low investment rates. There is a reform gap but also a distrust between EU member states, and we have waning or we see waning EU legitimacy. And all this taken together is obviously putting that whole single currency endeavor into a quite difficult situation. So let me start out my talk by looking back. So this section is previously on your area crisis. So what happened before? I would like to start with something that's no not so much used any longer, in, not even in, in the political economy or political science, but it's important to keep it in mind. I would like to put the euro and the euro era crisis into a broader context. And that broader context is nothing less than this neo-functional logic of integration. What do I talk about? Well, Europe is based on a very simple sequence of initiatives or ideas that all spill over into the next. There was the war in Europe, and then there was this very early idea to say, through economic integration, we get peace. If you want economic integration, you need open <coughs> borders. And the whole questioning of Schengen uh, is, is, in that, is in that point here. If you have open borders, you also need a single market. But if you have a single market, you need monetary integration. You need a single currency. But if you have monetary integration in the single currency, you actually need political integration, and this eventually will then lead to something like peace. That's the broader th scheme of things, which in this crisis, I think, is very often forgotten. And what's also often forgotten is that there is a, an institutional logic, that spillover logic, which is behind, which actually tells you that certain EU actors or institutions, in particular the Commission, play key roles in moving forward um, this integration. And the role of the ECB today is clearly one where we see another spillover taking place. So it's important for me to highlight this because neither the single market nor the single currency are goals in themselves. They're necessary steps in a much broader political project. 
And many economists, if you ask them, will tell you the euro was not an economic project, but a political project actually in that, in that larger scheme of things. And it's important to start with this because we need to understand better, I think, the relationship between the single market and the single currency. And it, it's very important, if you want to repair the euro, to see how it's connected to the single market. You know the single market is based on those four freedoms, freedom of, uh, free, free movement of goods, capital services, and people. And the commission is the watchdog, standing behind and making sure there is a level playing field between your area countries. So they regulated from chocolate to apples to banks, everything, <coughs> simply, and I think this can be justified, it's not only silly, because it's clear, if in one country you want to sell a certain good and you want also to sell it in another good, you need to agree on the standards, the regulations behind. This is, by the way, what we're trying to do the, with the US right now with TTIP, it's very similar. Europe did this in the, 19, in the 1980s uh, and 90s. But what people then figured out is obviously you have a commission there regulating standards, you have a competition watchdog, but the easiest way to gain a competitive advantage in Europe was simply to devalue your currency. And if you devalue your currency by 10%, then you clearly can sell the same car for 10% lower in the price and thereby actually lead the entire single market at absurdum because it cannot function if you have this possibility um, to devalue your exchange rate. And so the logic of this, the main spillover in what I've said so far from the single market is obviously the single currency. And the objective was to say, we need a single currency, we need a single sing central bank, and we need this economic and monetary union, as it was called. The problem of EMU right from the beginning was it was never an economic and monetary union. It was always only a monetary union with very little interaction in economic areas among the member states. I'll come back to this. I sometimes like to call this minimalist monetary union because this E in EMU is missing. We have no economic union. There is far too little convergence. And again, it's important to put this into context. Otherwise, it's very hard, in my view, to understand the crisis. And what happened in the crisis? And uh, um, how should this understanding of the crisis then help us understand where to, where to move next. This is my, uh, my, my big second point in this, uh, in this presentation. I think what's clearly often misunderstood in this crisis is that it is portrayed as a debt crisis. The euro crisis, in my view, is not a debt crisis. It's something which is much deeper, much more structural. And I would like to, you to embark with me on some kind of thought experiment to understand which kind of uh, um, crisis trigger there was in the background. And to me, the key problem of what was going on in Europe is really, I sometimes label this the ECB's one-size-fits-none problem. And you'll understand what, 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 I, what I mean by this. Let's try to see what a single currency or a single monetary policy actually does. If we assume there are two areas, this room is not well designed for this. Otherwise, I could say, you know, we have the right-hand side of the room seen for me and we have the left side of the room um, seen for me. Imagine there are two countries, and one side of the room has a 4% inflation rate, and the other side has a 0% inflation rate, okay? And you form a monetary union. Then obviously, the average inflation rate in that monetary union is 2%. And what would the European Central Bank do? It would assume that both sides in this room have a 2% inflation rate, and it would set the interest rate for those of you who know the economics a little bit, it would set the interest rate in a way that actually helps an economy that has this 2% inflation rate. The problem is, in the euro area, and that was actually the case, as you will see in a few minutes, one area had 4% inflation, the other had 0% inflation. So the ECB did the right monetary policy for a country that did not exist. There was a virtual kind of business cycle the ECB tried to focus upon. And why was that bad? Well, it contributed to the emergence of massive imbalances. And you can understand why. If I have one area, let's call that high inflation part of the room here, Ireland and Spain in the 2000s. What went on? Those countries went into a bubble. Inflation rates started to rise. 
asset prices, real estate started to shoot up. <coughs> unemployment went down in Spain. Unemployment went down in Italy. Um, the governments got high surpluses. They didn't go into debt. Spain and Ireland never broke the rules of the Stability and Growth Pact. They did exactly what was required. They performed extremely well in the euro area. And on the other side, very often forgotten today, there was Germany. And Germany didn't have any growth. One of the highest or the highest unemployment rate in Europe went into deficits. Germany at that time was called the sick man of Europe. And the problem of that setup was that the ECB, with its targeting that virtual middle, actually pushed the boom countries even further in the boom because interest rates did not rise sufficiently high to slow down the Irish and Spanish economy. But at the same time, the interest rates were too high for Germany. And so Germany went deeper and deeper and deeper into that fundamental crisis. And obviously, therefore, the two parts of the euro area, instead of moving together and creating a single economic space, moved apart. And that is very important in the understanding of the crisis, because not only did the ECB's unique interest rate aggravate the problem, but there were no channels to readjust between those two regions and actually help them to come together again. How could that work? Don't we have the same setup in the US? Michigan is not growing. Texas is growing. How do the Americans deal with that? Well. There are three or four channels in the US that actually help those regions then to come closer together again. One is a single budget at the federal level, which is if my Michigan site is not growing at all and not producing any taxes, but Texas is putting a lot of tax money into the common pot, then the federal government is not stopping its investments in Michigan and thereby indirectly it channels money from Texas to Michigan. We don't have that in the European Union. Think about the unemployment insurance. If Texas has no unemployed person and everyone is unemployed in Michigan, what happens? Well, Texans pay. It's not entirely true in the US system because some of this is state-based. But just for the purpose of understanding what's going on, let me simplify. If all Texans pay into the common unemployment insurance, but all people from Michigan receive the unemployment benefits, then this is actually taking some steam out of the Texan economy, but putting some steam into the Michigan economy, thereby bringing those two blocks together. We don't have that in the European Union. Second point. Third point, labor migration. It's an overestimated feature of the US economy, but still, if no one is unemployed in one area, then people move into that area because the labor market shows some shortages. And this is another channel of adjustment. The fourth channel, very often, again, misunderstood or not quoted, is the financial market. In the US, there is a single um, stock market system. Everyone can invest in the same companies. In Europe, we technically have that. But if you look at the way banks, actors, finance the economies, <coughs> we really have a totally fragmented financial market and economy in the euro area. And so the consequence of this is that instead of seeing con convergence in the early years of the euro area, we saw the exact opposite, total divergence. And uh, this is just unit labor costs. So the, this, this, this cost measure of labor in different European countries and what, you, and what you can see here is that in 2007, right before the crisis erupted, the orange line down here is Germany. So German labor costs did not rise at all. German wages, put in different words, did not rise during this crisis time. Where did wages go up? In Ireland, in Spain, the yellow and the green line. And this is even under or uh, compressing the picture, which in some sectors was much starker than that. So we saw wage differences of 100 to 140 between Germany and Greece. And this is this point in time where, anecdotally, we can say some German apple juice was sold in supermarkets in Athens because it had become cheaper than Greek apple juice. And obviously, 
a large ingredient is here in the differential of the wage costs between the different, between the different sectors. And that's a key ingredient to understanding what happened in the euro area crisis. Because there was no way to bring these two blocks back together again and create convergence. What could have been done? Well, we could have tried to continue on this path towards more convergence, but it did not take place. This is a summary measure of convergence, which I put together with uh, a number of colleagues. And you can see the different periods in the European integration project. So there was a first period from the 1970s until the start of the single market, where there was basically no convergence taking place. But then we saw with the single market and with the Maastricht Treaty and the aim to adopt the euro, we saw countries trying to actually converge in their business cycles, in their economic exchanges. But once the euro got introduced, we have actually seen this type of decline in convergence again, which is clearly detrimental to the European Union project. What could have been done in order to prevent this? Well, economists have this concept which is called the um, real exchange rate channel, and I'm not going to, bore, uh, to, 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 to bother you with economic theories. The idea is very simple. If different economies share the same market and produce similar goods, then a price difference will immediately be brought back to some kind of competition, through some kind of competition channel and equate those balances. So we would never see this type of divergence if those economies were totally integrated and we had this real exchange rate channel working. We didn't have that in the European Union. What we would need to have is a really functioning single market, a fully integrated economic union so that those channels can actually operate. We could also have used national policies to stabilize, so actually take steam out of the Irish or Spanish economy and help Germany to come back during that uh, crisis period, but that would have required more European Union control or coordination and uh, it's obviously not something member states wanted to do. They wanted to conduct their own economic policies. We could have had rebalancing through redistribution, simply transfers. You know, that common budget, which you know, not only in this country, but in particular in the country I am coming from, you know, that small neighboring country of, of, of the Netherlands called, called Germany, how hesitant people are with regard to transfers. And obviously nothing happened, and the result was the crisis. We saw a total collapse of the boom countries, even those with low debt. Again, let me repeat. Ireland and Spain didn't have a debt problem. Greece had, that's true. Portugal had a debt problem, but that was not the root cause of the crisis. To me, the root cause is really that divergence in economic policies. And capital pulled back. If you are on the low growth side, of economic and monetary union and want to have returns, where do you invest your money? Well, Germans invested their money in Ireland, Spain, and Greece. And so when they collapsed, there was the choice between pest and cholera. You either lose your money or you bail them out. And this is exactly what we, what we saw. We also then had this idea, once you don't believe countries can rescue themselves, then you actually start to speculate them against them. This is something Paul de Grauer, uh, um, friend and colleague, uh, calls a self-fulfilling fiscal crisis. And uh, the ingredients for that once in a lifetime, regional crisis, were all to put together. And we went into those uh, now six uh, years of a fundamental uh, euro area crisis. The way I like to conceptualize what could have been done and uh, uh, how we should think about the euro is in this chart here. And uh, it's a trilemma. Those of you who are in social sciences know trilemmata. The world is full of trilemmata. We just don't know it. Um, this trilemma here uh, shows you something um, which yeah, I like to uh, use to explain how to think conceptually about the European Union. So we basically, uh, when looking at this, say there are two of those three corners of the triangle, we can combine, but we have to give up the third, okay? And in what I've told so far, I think this should become relatively clear and straightforward. So 
you have three goals. The first goal is you want a national conduct of economic policies. So we created monetary union, but we didn't want to give up the control over our national budget, structural reforms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. National conduct of economic policies. This is up here. Okay. Then we want crisis prevention. We want to avoid this divergence context, which I outlined up to now. Second point: we want to avoid this. And third something very dear, again, to Germans or to other countries in the North, we don't want to stabilize through transfers without having the possibility to control what's happening with that money. Moral hazard. We want to avoid moral hazard. And now the idea is, logically, it's very hard to combine all three. Why? Well, if we combine the national conduct of economic <coughs> policies and we don't have any transfers, then we are actually in the original Maastricht Treaty framework. We don't have a, or we have a no bailout rule. We don't have the right to give money to countries. And we combined this. What did we give up? Well, actually, we ran quite logically in total divergence and therefore into a crisis. Now you can say, how do you, if you, do, if you want to have this here, you can either do, combine it with this here, to which I'll come in a second, or you can say, you keep the national conduct of economic policies, but you avoid the crisis through transfers. What happens then? Well, you give up this idea of not having moral hazard. You give money away for free, and you run into something we in Germany call the transfer union. If you want to insult someone in Germany, you tell them, you want the transfer union. You know, this is really as <laughs> some of the worst things uh, you, you, can, you can say in Germany. And the logic is quite clear. This is something the the crisis countries wanted from Germany. To say, you know, agree to euro bonds, just give your money away, and don't bother us with any kind of control. Moral hazard down here. The third option is to say, well, you can combine those two, but then you give up the national conduct of economic policies. And this is what we've done with Greece. We give them money, but in order to avoid the moral hazard problem, we tell them, but then we dictate how you should run your economic policies. And this is, if it's nicely formulated, it's called federalism. <coughs> there are all kinds of other names for this. Ask Yanis Varoufakis. <laughs> but clearly, a federation works that way. And this is how the US works to some extent, which is you have a grant giving function of the federal government. You have that taxing and unemployment function. But that actually doesn't give the states in the US full autonomy in the conduct of their economic policies, because a lot is done at the level of the federation. As you might know or might not know, the share of the European Union budget is extremely small. It's 1% of EU GDP. It's economically inexistent. And so we don't have that set up in, uh, in the European Union. And the question is now, can we fix this? I think we can. And I think we need, not only for my health, because if we don't fix it, the euro is going to die. But I really think there are ways to fix this. And uh, <coughs> there are various ways to look at how to fix this. This is what the ECB thinks about this. And I like to show this graph, which is a graph from the ECB, to show to you that some institutions in the European Union context like to dream <coughs> and think there will be the next spillover. So this is a chart from the ECB produced after the four presidents report, the first report published in the uh, December of 2012 about how to finalize economic and monetary union. And the ECB said, you know, it's very simple. We have EMU, and so EMU basically leads to financial union, fiscal union, economic union, and political union, right? That's basically unions everywhere, and that's federalism. And I like the way the ECB puts this saying, it addresses structural problems in a comprehensive manner. Yes, you can argue this is comprehensive, right? And it reinforces the irrevocability or irreversibility of the, uh, of the euro. Obviously, that's almost the maximum solution. If you get all of this, then you are very happy. The question is, can we get all of this? And you know from your debates here and elsewhere, many people have serious doubts that we can move to something like a political union, fiscal union, economic union, financial union type of framework. And the reasons are known to everyone. Can political integration be successful in Europe? We don't have a common national identity. 
there is no common culture. Or is there? Sometimes when you are abroad in Asia, in, uh, 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 in other areas, you think there is. And the question is whether EU populations are ready for something like permanent transfers, a large common budget, more transfers of sovereignty to the EU level, competition across countries. A very famous um, uh, intellectual historian uh, uh, from Oxford, <coughs> Timothy Garton Ash, wrote in 2000 the following sentence. It is precisely the forced march to unity across the bridge too far of monetary union that is threatening the very achievement it is supposed to complete. It's a very elegant way of saying the spillover logic should have stopped before monetary union. And monetary union, because it implies all this, is not going to be successful. And what we have to ask or to show is, is that argument right? If you put it into stark terms, this is how the lack of political integration looks in Europe. Uh, on the upper left, you see a picture from Bild Zeitung, the German populist uh, newspaper, basically telling the Greeks, well, sell your islands, you uh, bankrupt Greeks. And by the way, sell also the Acropolis. <laughs> and the reaction from a uh, Greek newspaper is what you see on the bottom right here, which is the deepest type of cultural and historic conflict you can have. And what we saw in the last summer, obviously, was a way to actually push this almost to the extremes. So I think the question whether we can have a political unity has to be asked. My answer to this is I think we need to think outside the box and move away from some kind of gut reaction, which is to say, you know, we go towards federalism or we go towards a European superstate. I even think, as a pro-European, deeply convinced pro-European, that the idea of the United States of Europe, which many put forward, I don't think that's very helpful. And I'll tell you why. It's a concept behind which no one understands what actually is meant by it. And whether this implies we would have an only as a single football or soccer team, uh, uh, or an anthem, or would this just be a nation state replicated at the European Union level? I don't think that's necessary and needed. What I like to say is we need as much additional integration as necessary to stabilize the euro, but as little as possible. We need to keep that idea of subsidiarity in mind. And as you will see, I'm still quite far reaching in terms of what I think is needed, but we don't need that European super state um, at, the, uh, at the European level. The solution in conceptual terms is clearly we need some additional risk sharing in the euro area, but we also need some additional sovereignty sharing. And one way to conceptualize this is this through this concept of federalism by exception, which is based on the idea that in normal times, you preserve national sovereignty and have very little risk sharing, but in crisis times, there clearly is a stronger role of Europe and the federation becomes stronger. And this is what we've seen in the euro area crisis. And I think we now see it in the refugee crisis. It's a clear request by Chancellor Merkel saying, this is a crisis which cannot be dealt with at the, Euro at the national level, so we need the European level. And so the way to solve this trilemma is to say, we need a little bit of all those three. You know, it's a very um, simple way of putting this in order to have this kind of federalism by exception. How to do it? And here are some specific proposals. I can imagine some of you sit there and say, that's all very nice, but what exactly do you want to do? Here are building blocks for EMU reform. I think we need certain elements to prevent crisis, and we need certain elements to improve our response to crisis. What we need in order to prevent crisis is we need more convergence. We need to strengthen that real exchange rate channel I referred to earlier on, so the trading between euro area countries. We need some kind of cyclical stabilization, so something which is close to European unemployment insurance. I'll come back to this in a second. And we also need to enhance our ways to respond to certain crises by transforming the European stability mechanism, the ESM, into a ESM plus or a true European monetary fund, an EMF. I'll come back to this and we need to complete banking union. So let me briefly walk through those proposals and then come to my conclusion. Proposal one, I think we need to do more for convergence. Now I will be quick here. Um, convergence, as I mentioned, is, uh, is necessary, but we have done extremely little at the European level to allow our economies 
to, to, uh, to converge. We need to focus much more on inflation differentials. We need to focus more on the external balance and also on unit labor cost. There's a long economic debate behind whether Germany should also adjust upwards by increasing wages and stopping its export orientation. I think we'll can come back to this in the Q&A if you want, um, but that's the first point. Um, the real uh, institutional proposal, number one, is completing the single market. Markets in the euro area are not sufficiently <laughs> integrated, whatever you read and whatever they tell you about this. Monetary integration did not trigger an automatic deepening of economic integration. If you look at the market for services, the biggest markets we have, 70% of production in the European Union are services. Only 20% of the service sector is cross-border. So we have basically 18, 19, or 28 at the European level um, nation states that are insulated, and they need to do much more in order to, um, uh, to connect. What is needed for this? Well, certain things which are politically quite sensitive. We need to make labor mobility something that's easy. Can you take your pension from one country to the other? In fact, today you can but it's extremely difficult. It's almost impossible to get recognized, etc. I see some students in the room. When you are an Erasmus student and you want to open a bank account in a different country than your home country, you run into tons of difficulties. It's not easy to migrate in the European Union. Professional qualifications are recognized almost nowhere in the way they should be recognized, legally. It's the case that you can exercise in the other country, but de facto, they prevent you from becoming a dentist with a Spanish degree in Germany or from becoming a notary with a law degree uh, from the Netherlands in France. It's impossible. And this actually really um, uh, slows down the level of integration um, we need. And I think this nexus between the proper functioning of the single market and the proper functioning of the euro is one of the most overlooked areas for reform where we really have to move forward. The point is the political costs are extremely high because all those areas where we like to protect our industries, especially in, in the services, are the ones which we would have to open up. And uh, some of you might know the Bolkestein Directive that attempt to free up services in the European Union. It was killed by almost every member state. And I think this is something that hurt the euro uh, even if uh, the arguments um, uh, why it was kicked down sometimes can be understood. Proposal number two. I think we need some kind of cyclical adjustment across countries, and it can be done as an unemployment insurance. I don't like the idea of a common European unemployment insurance, which is very prominent here. Frank van den Broeke, um, who is uh, at Axis, I think, uh, uh, is one of the key proponents of this, has uh, extensively worked on that. I think it can be, you can do something very similar. You know, I go back to my Texas, Michigan example. What I would like to see in the European Union is a, is a common fund where those countries that grow very quickly put some of their money in and others can take it out. And it's not a permanent transfer from the rich to the poor. It's actually a transfer from those overshooting to those underperforming. And quite paradoxically, Germany in such a system would have received money from Spain and Ireland in the 2000s and would have put money back into Spain and Ireland now. And it might sound counterintuitive, but this is exactly what we, what we would have needed. Uh, those are the figures for Germany. We simulated this. I did a, um, a research project simulating such a scheme. And you can see up here those, um, those gray bars, how much Germany would have received and how much they would have put in. And you see it nicely follows that cycle of Germany. Um, uh, and uh, it's the same as if we shared some kind of common unemployment insurance or common, or common budget. I don't stay on this very long. Again, we, 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 can come, we can come back. This obviously raises the question whether we should deal with structural divergences in the euro area and how this should be done. Um, I don't think. When you talk about structural divergence, we, we talk about standards of living. And obviously, there's a big difference in standards of living between Bulgaria and, uh, and Germany, or even between southern Italy and northern Italy. And the question is, how do you deal with this, or whether you sh need to deal with this in the euro area context? My response is, I don't think we don't need to do that much in this field. The euro could probably function, even with stark, 
structural divergences for political reasons. You might like to compensate poorer people and get them to a higher level, but it's not necessary for the euro to function. And we have tools for this. We have the EU budget. We can involve the European Parliament. Um, but generally, this is so hotly contested and so costly that I think we don't need to focus on this. And when I give this kind of presentation in Germany, and probably something very similar is true for the Netherlands, um, I try to insist that giving money to Greece or Italy or Spain today doesn't necessarily have to be a one-way street which from there on will become a permanent transfer mechanism. If what I have here is right for Germany, then in the next crisis, if, if, if it's well designed, well, the Netherlands and Germany would get money from those countries, and so it would balance out. The German net balance would be zero, and that's something very different than something we know sometimes from our own countries where the rich regions permanently subsidize the poor. And while, again, you might want to have that in Europe, it's a political decision, you don't need to have it for the euro to function. I'll, I'll, I'll skip that. Proposal number three is I think we need to work on the representation and the coordination of economic policies at the euro area level. There's one principle, and that principle is we should give assistance to countries in crisis, but against strict conditionality. And the key problem we faced in this crisis is that the conditionality was not well developed, well controlled, and uh, well designed. The entire conflict last year with Greece was one about not knowing how far you could go, what the threat was, what the conditionality implied, and how far you could push that thing. And the most striking moment, I think, was that last night in July, when the final hours of the negotiations took place, who was negotiating with whom? It was Angela Merkel negotiating with Alexis Tsipras. And that should not happen in the European Union. There should be a European person sitting at the table and looking at Angela and looking at Alexis and saying, you have your legitimate interest, you have your legitimate interest, but I'm the European Union. And if you don't get together, then the entire European Union will suffer. So we need that honest broker at the table, and we don't have it. And this is why I think we need to redesign this entire concept of the European Stability Mechanism, the ESM, and we need a European finance minister. And that European finance minister should be the one sitting at that table, that face of the Troika, should report to the Commission, should report to the Eurogroup, and should be in charge of policy coordination and be that face of the Troika. And it should, that person should also be in charge of that European Monetary Fund. We have a long proposal, you can read uh, about this if you want to, where we basically argue that European Monetary Fund should give easy financing for small amounts. If a country runs into a liquidity crisis, you should have easy access to money. But then there should be a stepwise transfer of sovereignty to that institution if you don't comply. And this is, in fact, what we did with Greece. There was a stepwise transfer of sovereignty, but in a very uncoordinated, non-transparent way. And on top of this, without any democratic control. Who controls the Troika? No one. And so we need a way to bring the European Parliament in, to bring politics into this type of necessary stepwise transfer of sovereignty in a crisis context. I have a slide which I don't know whether you, you, can, you can read and understand in all details from where you're sitting, but the idea would really be just, you can read the paper which is behind, there would be this finance minister who would be in charge of the European Monetary Fund, who would be in charge of economic and fiscal uh, policy coordination and also have a small European investment budget to actually give carrots to countries that provide reform. And that person would be, like Federica Mogherini, the high representative in, in, in foreign policy, would be a double hat person, both connected to the Commission, but also connected to the Eurogroup and thereby the European Council. But most importantly, that person would be, and that's something the pro-Europeans don't like very much, would be under double control through a joint committee of national parliaments and the European Parliament. Why is that so important? I think Greece would have had much smaller concerns if they had had the impression that there was some legitimate input towards the requirements of the Troika and the MOUs 
um, and that would have been done through some kind of joint committee here. If it's only the European Parliament controlling, that's not sufficient. You take away a lot of autonomy from the nation states if you ask them to give up that crown right of budgetary policy making, and therefore you need some kind of national <coughs> parliament involvement. I'll skip this slide and come to my last core proposal, which is we obviously need to finalize banking union. And banking union implies that the risks we share in the euro area are indeed shared risks. My biggest concern in the next crisis is the following. If you fear a country can leave the euro area, then what you will do is put your money into a German bank account. I was so afraid of Greece leaving because I thought it's not Greece. I mean, it would have been a disaster for Greece. But even if we can contain all the immediate contagions, what you really have as a consequence is that in the moment you open the door in a monetary union for exit, it's only a matter of time until the next country leaves. And if you are in Italy and you know you know, there's no possibility my country can leave, you, you sleep well. If you know the door is open, then the next morning, perhaps not the next morning, but three months down the road, six months down the road, you'd say, I'd rather put my money into a German bank account because if Italy leaves, I'm fine. And if everyone does that, that triggers a downward spiral in the deposits of those crisis countries and it pulls the European Union apart. The only way to stop this is to have some kind of real banking union, not only with a single supervisory mechanism, which we have now, but also with some kind of joint deposit insurance scheme where it basically doesn't matter whether you have your money into an, in an Italian or German bank account, and that would uh, clearly strengthen the system. I would like to come to the conclusion and some, and some outlook of, uh, um, of where we are today. I think EMU today has five problems and they all need to be fixed together. As I mentioned, growth and employment are still too low and the effect is that the political costs of crisis are still rising and the rise of populism everywhere. There are very different types of populism. Perhaps you come back to this in, in Q&A. There is right-wing populism. There is right-wing sovereignism, as in France. There is skepticism about Europe, as in Poland, Hungary, or the UK. And then there is left-wing. Euroscepticism, as we've seen with Podemos and to some extent Syriza. But the political costs of this crisis are still rising, and this means this crisis is not over. Second, debt is still too high, and this means that we cannot help our economies to grow right now because we don't know where to take the money from. The economists would say the fiscal stance is neutral or contractionary, which is not what you won't want to have. Investments are still too low. We have sluggish demand and a reduction of what is called potential growth, so the capacity to grow. And the single market, as I mentioned, is not completed. Finally, EMU in the current setup, as I started out with, is clearly not sustainable. We have divergences, fragmentation, and still that moral hazard problem. What we need is now a political process to actually kickstart some of the ideas I've just outlined. And if I want to put everything I said into simple words, it's really we need to sit down together at the level of governments and think about how much do we need in terms of further integration to make this euro stable for the next storm? And can we actually push this through politically? This is what you would want to do. As much as necessary, but as little as possible. The problem is that we don't have this type of discussion taking place right now. Commission President Juncker is one of the very few who actually started or wanted to start this process by saying in this five presidents report, we need a process to sit together and talk. But this report is now already in the trash bins in Paris and Berlin, some other capitals as well. And I'm very afraid the discussion, which I've tried to outline here, is not going to take place. We face a time inconsistency problems. Member states are not motivated. We have a Brexit referendum. Um, still this year, probably in June or July. Then we have French elections in May. We have German elections in September. And there's no way we can start discussions until early 2018. So we need probably to use this time somehow. We're not going to do this. Uh, and therefore, we would probably now have to wait for that second phase, uh, which is a change of the treaty to complete EMU, which is required. 
to implement risk sharing and sovereignty sharing, but this now should tell you how difficult or the situation is in which we are right now. If during that time period where we haven't stabilized our ship, the next storm is going to come, then we have a real, real, real problem. And I'm not sure, I'm really not sure the euro can survive such a next storm if it were to come in the next, in the next years. Conclusions? The right conclusion in any debate on the European Union is always the last words of Jean Monnet's autobiography. Jean Monnet, that grandfather of European integration, ends his biography by saying, il faut continuer, continuer, continuer. We have to continue, continue, continue. That's sometimes called the bicycle theory of European integration, which is if you stop pedaling, then you will fall. The problem is that even on a bicycle, you need to know in which direction you want to go, and this is something Jean Monnet didn't really talk about. And I would like to leave you with that quote by Timothy Garton Ash again, who says, many Europeans are convinced that if we do not go forward toward unification, we must necessarily go backward. This view is expressed in the so-called bicycle theory of European integration. If you stop pedaling, the bicycle will fall over. Actually, as anyone who rides a bicycle knows, all you have to do is put one foot back on the ground, and anyway, Europe is not a bicycle. <laughs> That's true. But then you will never reach your goal. Thank you very much. There was a lot uh, to think about and to discuss uh, afterwards. Um, my role is just to give some political context. It was already in uh, some in the pr presentation, and to pose some questions uh, on uh, on the words of uh, Professor Enderlein. Um, I want to step back in time, just one day, Strasbourg, January 20th, 2016. Europe is a large, complex, shared project that can only move forward one step at a time. Europe doesn't need new lofty ideas or grand visions. It needs results, it needs to deliver. And for that, we first need to follow up on what we've agreed. Keeping promises and sticking to agreements should be the nor new normal in Europe. A deal is a deal. This is Mark Rutte, the Dutch Prime Minister. From his speech yesterday in the European Parliament, his purely pragmatic approach is uh, um, it's the Dutch way nowadays. Vision has become a dirty word in the political vocabulary. So the, the theme of tonight is about vision of Europe. It would give the chills to Mr. Rutte. Vision has become a dirty word. Step by step, not looking ahead 10 years. That's not very inspiring, but an understandable re response to the growing skepticism in the Netherlands and in a lot of other countries. For many Europeans, the added value of the European project isn't clear. What did the political integration brought us? What is the added value of the internal market? And where is the promised prosperity that would be the result of the euro? All we see is unemployment, crisis, bail out banks, bail out euro countries. And in exchange for all this, we have to give up our sovereignty. We have to accept interference of Brussels with our budgets, with our economic policies, and maybe also with our social economic policies. In this political context, we need to stabilize the economic and monetary union. Vision is forbidden. forbidden. Sharing, sharing sovereignty is unpopular. So someone like Henrik Enderlein, who says that only a few adjustments has, are needed, is very welcome in a country like this, this Euro critic country. But the question is, are these proposals enough? And in a political context is the question very important, are these in, uh, indeed just a few minor adjustments? For instance, finalizing the banking union, is that a minor step? It means introducing a European deposit guarantee scheme, something the Germans oppose, and a lot of Dutch people also don't want to guarantee, for instance, Greek deposits. It means also breaking the ties between banks and sovereigns, not just in words, like we do it today, but also in practice, not partially, but completely. 
or introducing a, a Minister of Finance for the Eurozone, that doesn't sound like a small step for Euro country governments. Does this minister also mean that he has a budget? Uh, you talked about, uh, how do you, did you call it, um, improving cyclical, uh, cyclical adjustments, a common fund. Uh, it, it, that, that's, that's still a large step and very sensitive uh, nowadays. Last week, Eurogroup uh, uh, chairman Jeroen Dijsselbloem, in, uh, in his speech in Utrecht, criticized the plan for a central budget. He said it looks, like, uh, looks uh, to him like a holy grail for some politicians and economists. He doesn't believe in it. He doesn't want it. So completing and perfectioning the economic and monetary union, union hasn't been top priority during the crisis. You already said it about the ship. Um, I fully agree with, uh, with this metaphor. EU President Herman van Rompuy, the former president, came up with some far-reaching proposals, but they all ended up in a dark drawer. And today, the new buzzword is not handing over sovereignty, but sharing sovereignty, something you use also. And you say only in crisis time. Now, I would say, especially in crisis time, that's, that's the moment that no one wants to hand over or share sovereignty. But OK, we can discuss about that. But also, for Mr. Rutte, sharing sovereignty is, is the new buzzword. It doesn't sound that, that, um, that frightening as handing it over. Uh, it's better to share our powers with the Germans than to give our power to the Brussels Eurocrats. But will that mean that the necessary structural economic reform will take place in this sharing model? Can the Eurogroup or a Euro summit force countries to act? Because that is needed for the convergence of the Eurozone economies. This convergence, as was shown, was supposed to take place automatically after 1999. But what happened, also according to a formal ECB report, there was divergence in the Eurozone. So now the idea is, it's rather voluntarily, that uh, countries can come up with best practices and other countries will follow automatically these examples so we don't have to force them, uh, but we share it and we do it voluntarily. I do not believe in this model of sharing sovereignty. Um, I, I, I like it, I like the idea, but I don't think it works. Look at the way, for instance, the budgetary rules are applied. Um, that's, that's, not a, that's not a voluntary scheme, but it's, it's uh, Brussels is supposed to, to force us to, to keep up with the budgetary rules. But in practice, that's already very disappointing. France is getting away with almost everything they propose. They get more and more time to reach the budgetary goals of stability and growth pact. And with this in mind, would it be very likely that more coordination of economic policy would work? I doubt it very much. Now we have the five, five presidents' reports. You already mentioned it. Uh, Dijsselbloem is one of those five presidents. I don't think he had a very good time in this commission, but okay. Um, in this report, they talk about all these unions, the economic union, the fiscal union, the financial union, the political union, just like Van Rompuy did. And this report had, has concrete deadlines. There's something I, I read from Mr. Enderlein. He was very in favor of this, concrete deadlines. But the problem is, the deadlines are concrete, but the substance is very vague. For instance, uh, the, the proposals about the central budget, the report calls this a common macroeconomic stabilization function. And this is what is written down in the report. While the degree to which currency unions have common budgetary instruments differs, all mature monetary unions have put in place a common macroeconomic stabilization function to better, the deal, to better deal with shocks that cannot be managed at the national level. So it's very natural, they say, for the Euro area to come up also with this kind of stabilization scheme, a budget for the Eurozone, okay? And here comes the concrete proposal the objective of automatic stabilization at Euro level would be to improve the cushioning of large macroeconomic shocks and thereby make EMU overall more resilient. Okay. The exact design of such economic uh, Euro area stabilizers requ require more in-depth work. This should be done by a proposed expert group. So this is a very concrete proposal of this five presidents report. I already know that Dijsselbloem and just the Netherlands and possibly other countries aren't in favor at all of this idea. If you believe in the few adjustments of the economic and monetary union, uh, a, politic a political union won't, won't be necessary. That would be very good news in a skeptic country, in a skeptic Europe. 
but will it all work? Politicians in the Netherlands, like Prime Minister Rutte and Minister Dijsselung, think that only what is achievable politically is necessary. I'm afraid that it doesn't work that way. I'm afraid we do need a grand vision. Not because a vision in itself will solve all the problems, but as a way to be honest to the electorate what the consequences are of having a common currency. It makes no sense denying lessons from the euro crisis. If we do that, then we know for sure that the eurozone will not survive the next crisis. Thank you.